So first I would like to explain you, because many people were asking me this question, how this grading system works. Um, the concept is pretty simple. So we're gonna grade you by the end of the whole course. And the grading will happen by five parameters. So we're gonna look at your uh, pet project, which you're gonna create. It has to be some software product. We're gonna look at it and we're gonna decide by five uh, characteristics by five qualities of the product, how good it is, how good are your requirements, how good you explained your design, how good is your architecture, then how good is your code, and then finally, how good you were at the labs, or how good is your popularity of this project on GitHub. So you can get some GitHub stars. So many people ask me about this criteria, which is quite simple. So if you have 15 stars, then you have 15 points. If you have 10 stars, you have 10 points. If you have more than 15 stars, then you have 15 points. That's pretty simple. Also, we have two, actually three milestones down the road. So we have milestone one, which is gonna happen on the 6th of September next week. We have milestone two and we have milestone three. So milestones are alpha version of your product, then beta version of your product, and then final version of your product. So we're gonna check you three times. How good is your product? First time we check you, we give you some numbers. So we give, for example, your requirements are very good. So you get uh, five points, 10 points. Then your code is almost zero because you didn't write any code. So for code, you get like one point. Then your architecture is more or less okay. So you get five points. So on the first milestone, you get some points. On the second milestone, we reevaluate your code. We reevaluate re your product and we give you a different number of points assuming that they will grow. So we expect the amount of points to grow on the next milestone. And then the final milestone, we check you again for the third time, and then we look at the numbers again, and then we give you so like a final estimate of your work. So it's incremental, incremental, iterative, just like agile. So it's not like on the first milestone, you deliver something, then you get the points, and these points are stored, and then you have these points, and you, you like put them into your, uh, your assets. No, it's every time you're being re-evaluated. So your product being re-evaluated every time. So for example, on the first milestone, you get uh, 30 points total. On the second milestone, your grade is 55 points. So they don't add up. It's not 30 plus, plus 55. It's like every time you new score. Make sense? That's it. So this milestone is basically gonna help you to re, like, help you assess your progress, to, to know what's going on with your progress. Any questions with that? How is your progress, by the way? Who managed to make something? Who of you have any software products so far? None of you. That's good. I remember me being a student. <laughs> I would do the same. But maybe you have some products on your own, which you maybe you can make a new version, maybe redo it. Maybe rework it. And how about the ideas which I dropped in the chat? Any of them triggered any interest? Yes. So. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So just try it, and maybe one of those. You know, I was, uh, I remember that story. I was once, that was a long time ago, I was uh, invited for an interview by, um, by Adobe. It's a pretty large company, so they wanted to hire me. And as a part of the interview, they, they said that uh, in order to interview me, they don't, they're not so much interested in the interview. That that's the way they structured the interview. They said, you have to do your homework, so create a software product for yourself and show us how you make it. And then you send it to us, the code, we take a look at the code. If we like it, then we invite you for the interview, then you come and then we talk and then probably we hire. So the, my, my, uh, my job was to create uh, a web service, just a web service without using any uh, frameworks. So it was, I was a Java programmer at that time and they wanted me to create a, a framework, uh, not, not a framework, but actually the, the, the web service. And I decided, okay, how about I don't waste my time on doing something for them? How about I make this product, uh, some, uh, how about I make this product a meaningful product for my, uh, for my, for my own? And, uh, sorry, I put the microphone for our online viewers. And, uh, and I made a product, which was the, the system for uh, Amazon uh, S3, in Amazon S3, probably you know what is Amazon S3, it's not like a storage of objects, and Amazon still doesn't have a feature of making private projects public. 
So I decided, okay, how about I turn this need into something uh, like a test product for them? So I made this. I made this product. I sent it to them. They checked it. They said, okay, it looks good. They invited me for the interview. We had some some like some meeting, and finally they didn't they didn't hire me because some reasons. But that was a long time ago. That was probably I don't know maybe eight years ago, nine years ago. I already forgot about the interview. But the product is alive. The product is still alive. It has thousands of customers. It's an open source product, which I have in my collection, which is one of my pet projects. And it's alive, it stays online, people use it, thousands of people, everything is great. So I suggest you think about the same. So every time somebody gives you like an assignment, they say, okay, do it for the course, make it a pet project, so let's, because I'm gonna evaluate your skills in software design. Don't do it for me, do it for yourself. Make something interesting, which in the future, may become a product of your own and uh, it will be on the market, it will be one of your pet projects. Actually, the more pr pet projects you have, I believe, the, 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 um, the higher is gonna be your value as, a, as an employee for the future. So when people will hire you, they will pay attention to what you have in, in your collection. If you have nothing, if you have only knowledge and you threw away everything you've done during the study, and uh, that's, that's one story. But if you have something created and the products are online, maybe it's a mobile app, maybe it's a web app, people are gonna love you much more. Today we're gonna talk, it's a lecture number five, we're gonna talk about object thinking. That's one of my favorite topics, actually. I will tell you about the work I do in this area. Um, so object thinking and domain-driven design. Who ever heard about domain-driven design? DDD, okay, a few of you. But we're gonna talk more about object thinking. Object thinking, I will, I will introduce you to object-oriented programming from a little bit different perspective, because on the next few courses, we will talk, we already talked about object-oriented analysis and design, we're gonna talk about design patterns today, we're gonna talk about uh, other object-oriented stuff, about UML, but, today, but in this lecture, we'll tell you how wrong is object-oriented programming, and how it can be improved, and how you can do it a little bit different, or much different, than other people. So, um, object-oriented programming is in trouble. It's not only me saying that, but many people said it many, many times. For example, this very famous, already dead, uh, scientist and researcher and author of many, many good things for programming, he said that object-oriented programs are, you can read it. So, object-oriented programs were criticized right from the beginning. They were said that they are basically introduced, they introduce mess instead of solving mess. Even though, as I will explain you, they were you know, the intention was to solve the mess instead of to introduce it. Another one, uh, that's the guy who invented uh, the, the very term object-oriented programming, Alan Kay. So Alan Kay was the one who suggested to name this discipline which we, which we, which we practice for I don't know how many years. He said it uh, 24 years ago. So we practiced this stuff for 25 years at least. So he said that even though object-oriented programming was a good idea, but um, you know, uh, it's not what C++ implements. So it was a really good idea. It is still a really good idea conceptually, but in practice, it doesn't look so great. Another guy, Paul Graham, who knows about this guy? Who of you are actually interested in becoming startup founders to make a startup, to make money out of one, two, others will be just employees, right? You'll just work for payroll, right? What's, what's the future you're looking for? I mean, there are two options, in my opinion. You can work for a payroll or you can be a startup founder. So you can make your company or you can work for someone's company. So if you decide to go for the first direction, to make a company, to be a startup founder, then you have to know this guy. He's the founder of the, the most successful accelerator for startups in California. It's called Y Combinator. Who knows about Y Combinator? So there you go. So he's the founder. Who knows about Hacker News? You read Hacker News. That's the guy who wrote the software for Hacker News. Hacker News was written originally by him as a software. That's the site, the website, which we use for, I don't know, maybe over 10 years already. So he's the, the father of startup ecosystem, I think, in California, in Silicon Valley. So he's a, and he's a functional programming uh, adept. So he likes functional programming. He's, he's coming from, he's an author of a very good book about Lisp. Uh, so he, he, he loves functional programming. Maybe that's why he said this about object-oriented programming. Uh, about this spaghetti code, the sustainable way to write spaghetti code. So, um, which is a shame. 
So people being, I put these quotes into chronological order. So the first one was by Dijkstra, and the second one by Alan Kay, this one by Paul Graham. Uh, next one by Linus. So probably you know this guy, yeah? Who doesn't? Raise your hand. Linux is the author of Linux operating system, which we all use, and uh, Linux operating system is written in which language? C, that's right, but not C++. There are two different languages. So C++ is an extension of C. C was a language, you know, for many, many years with us. Many things were written in C originally in operating system. Free BSD, BSD operating system, Berkeley. Uh, I don't know how, to, what's the BSD stand? Software distribution. Uh, so the, the operating system from Berkeley and then the Linux and the FreeBSD, they're all written in C and Linux especially. And then C++ was introduced and um, you see what he says. So C++ introduced uh, objects and not so many people were happy with this idiotic model object crap, whatever. So I kind of, that was kind of a teaser and we're going to talk today about first the philosophy of object-oriented programming. I'll say a few words how philosophically object-oriented programming was intended to be. Not how it is today, but intended to be. Next, we will discuss what is an object. I'll show you that this is, I think, this is where the misconception stays, is in the understanding of what is an object. Then we'll talk about three most evil parts of object-oriented programming. That's, I think, in my opinion, those three things actually make object-oriented programming so wrong that people so much complain about it. Then we talk about domain-driven design, of course, and then I will talk about elegant objects. Who ever heard about this name? Never. Okay, one person, two. Uh, that's the title of my book, yeah, but that's more than a book. It's like a trend in software development, which we started uh, seven years ago, which kind of tries to improve object-oriented programming in different ways, writing books, making blog posts, making software, making software libraries, even making new programming languages. So from many angles, we're trying to attack object-oriented programming to make it better. And then I will suggest you books, where to, what to read, venues where to publish your work, and then what to do next, call for action. Let's go. First, the philosophy of object oriented programming. I actually changed a little bit the menu on the top, so you can see we're gonna go from the left to the right, and then the sub-menu stays under the, under the main menu. So philosophy of object oriented programming. That's how it started. First, we had the era of go-to. That's my, I decided to give it the name, the era of go-to. This is the program which is, what's the language, who knows? Basic, that's right, that's basic programming language. I studied, I started to, to learn programming from basic programming language. That's how, that's how my first program looked when I was, I think I was 12 years old. So I wrote something like this. I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but that looked something like this. So you can probably tell what this program does if you look at it for a few minutes, for a few seconds. Who can tell me what it does? Number What's? Guessing number. Guessing number game, yeah. So it asks you for the number. The first line, what, what do these numbers stay, do on the, on the left side of the, of the line? 10, 20? Upper box line, and the basic you count in, in, in decimal because if you want to insert some other line, uh, like 11 or 12, we want to uh, change all other numbers. That's right, that's right. You understand, right? <laughs> That's right, yes, that's right. So that was the idea on the basic. So these numbers, each line has to have a number in basic. And uh, because they didn't have the, the interactive editors, so like we have now, so you cannot move the cursor to the upper, upper line and then click enter and insert the line in between two lines. The only way to edit the text was to enter a new line. So start, when you need to enter this program into, for example, GW basic, then you type 10 space and then the text of the line. Then you click enter and the line goes into the program. Then you type 20, then the text, click enter and it goes into the program. And then you type list, L-I-S-T, click enter and it prints you the whole program. So you can see, okay, it's one line, two lines, three lines. And then if you see that there are two lines and you want to insert the line between them, the only way to do that is to type a line with a number which will jump into in between these two lines. So you type 11, for example. For example, you forgot to type the, you forgot the line which has to stay between 10 and 20. So you type 11, then the text, and it jumps into this line. Again, you type list, and the list uh, prints you everything showing what's there. That was the way I was writing code for when I was a 
kid, not like you younger, like 12, 13 years old. That's how we were programming. And that's why the numbers. And then there's go to operator. Check, a line, check, check the line number 30. If t more than 5, then go to 120. So this go to jumps to the different line, and the execution continues from the line 120, 120. That's how it was. So no if, no, no, no structures. I mean, no indentation, no nothing like that. It's always, it was like that. It, it looked like the uh, all the movements from the lines you had to do with the go to operator, which was horrible to be honest. In order to understand this program, it was difficult to do. This go to operator was criticized a lot. And many people complain about its existence. Then we move to the, to the era, to the territory of structured programming. This is on the left exactly the same logic, but in a language which you can recognize, what's the language on the left? Pascal, that's right. So on the left, we have a language called Pascal. I don't know, Turbo Pascal or not, not Pascal, some Pascal. I mean, it's, that was probably before Turbo Pascal. So just Pascal, I also was programming Pascal. So I remember my code in Pascal. On the right, we have something which is called, what's the right name for this? Flowchart, I think. Yeah, block structure. It's more like, I think, Russian option for this. I think it's flowchart. So the flowchart is more structured way to present the same code. So you see, we have no go-to in here. So the same code, but no go-to operators. Only structures, if, then, else. One structure goes into another structure, goes to another structure. So go to operator was claimed as bad, and it was uh, suggested that it has to be removed from our code. So we moved to the territory of structured programming. Even though it happened on the paper, it didn't happen in reality right now. I did a check. I did it probably two weeks ago. I have it even on Twitter. I posted that. I checked the source code of Linux uh, kernel. And uh, I found uh, there, there are 16, 16 million lines of code, and I found the go-to operators. Uh, how many of them you can think? 440,000. Actually, Linux doesn't use structured programming. Exactly. So Linux doesn't use structured programming. Is there any problem for, for most of the error handling because it saves the mess? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about the mess. I think they don't use, uh, they, do, they use go to so much for speed, no. for performance, no? So anyway, they use it. So maybe you're right. So maybe there is no structured programming over there. They use GoTo a lot, even though GoTo was claimed like a bad idea, I don't know how many years ago, 20 or more. Like it was tons of articles about that. So originally, originally suggested by Dijkstra, uh, he suggested that GoTo is a terrible idea. So we must uh, stop making languages with this GoTo operator, but it's still alive. Linux kernel, open it up, search for GoTo. You will find tons of this operator, which makes this you know, jumps from, from one place to another. So that's the era of structured programming. I remember that time there was like a, like a you know, fresh air for, for many people, for me at least. Like instead of go to, we make these structures and in structures you see much clearer what's going on, just like in this flow chart. The next step was procedural programming. Next step or the step before, but this is what we have probably now. I took this one from, uh, I think it was Linux kernel or something, because I took this snapshot, screenshot many, 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 many months ago. So procedural programming is something where you call procedures. So people started to realize that it's good to isolate certain parts of the code, certain segments of code into some places where we can think about them in isolation. So it's kind of a, you know, kind of a, let's call it abstraction in this way, that we, uh, we don't want to, uh, uh, maybe it's not abstraction, maybe it's something else. So when you look at the large code, and you, you don't want to think about the whole algorithm. You want to, for example, this algorithm is taking the data from the input and then uh, uh, sorts the data, make the, make the list sorted, and then prints the data out and then stores to the database. So basically, there are, there are four conceptual steps. There are four you know, procedures, four blocks of logic. And you don't want to think about all of them when you look at the code. You want to think of, the, of one of them when you look at one of them, then on another one, another one. So you, you want to 
make your scope of visibility smaller. So you want to think about smaller things when you look at, at your code. And that's the, the procedural programming was, was actually a big help. So you were able to take some part of your code, move it somewhere, and call it procedure A. And then you call this procedure from here. And something happens inside the procedure. And then you call another procedure, another procedure. So basically, your flow of execution stays here, and you can jump from procedure to procedure, and they can also jump to, to, to other procedures. So it's like a you know, uh, jump from procedure to procedure, but each procedure is more or less isolated piece of logic. So you can look at this isolated piece of logic and understand what's going on much easier comparing to looking at the large, at the large uh, code base and uh, uh, making the decision there when it's much more difficult. But still, still it's a problem because when you look at this code, it's kind of hard to understand what it does because many, many calls to different procedures and eventually you're gonna lose track, in my opinion, you're gonna lose track of what's going on. And then object-oriented programming jumped in. So I draw this uh, picture, which if you look at it, there are three objects. So people decided, okay, how about we uh, move from procedures to objects? So each place where the code stays, we call it procedure. And um, actually not a procedure, but we call it an object. So it was like a procedure there, but from now we're gonna call it an object. We put together all the logic which is relevant to certain aspect of the code execution, and we call it an object. For example, on the left we have database. Database, the object which has two, two methods. Let's call them methods or oper operations, maybe two entry points, read and write. And the database is connected to the real database. So the, the object database with the green line connects to the real database, which is MySQL. The object on the right is HTML. Let's say it's an HTML with the one method render, and the render connects to HTTP socket, for example. I don't know what exactly stays there, but for example, it's HTTP slash socket, something which is an external channel of data. So uh, we need to get from the database and store in the, in the screen. So how do we do this? We introduce another object we call it controller. A controller, first line goes to the database, Second line takes the data from the database. Third line pushes the data to the HTML. That's how people understood object-oriented programming. So before, we had three procedures. Controller, database, and HTML. Today we have objects. Okay, great, how about we make three objects instead, instead of three procedures? And they make three objects. But that's wrong. This, in my understanding, is a wrong interpretation of object-oriented programming, and this is why everything so bad happened to object-oriented programming. Because this is not how it should be. We should not have a controller. We should not, have, we should not think into the same paradigm, the same, the same way of thinking as we had before. Like, we have point of control, we have data which moves from left to right, and then we have objects which do something with the data. It should be different, I'll show you how. Because if we have it like this, then we get the spaghetti code. We still have the same. The code blocks interlap between each other, the same procedures like we had before, but now they're called objects, so they interlap. Why? Because, these because the data, the core problem here is that the data jumps out of objects and we let other objects deal with the data which are supposed to be encapsulated. We discussed encapsulation with you, I believe, last time. So this encapsulation is not present when object-oriented programming is designed this way. The right design, the same, the same picture with the same uh, objects, but now they are designed better. And by the way, I wanted to ask you, who knows, let me jump back a little bit, who knows what these plus symbols mean in, in front of the... Public, exactly, exactly, that's from UML. So I kind of pretended that this diagram is UML. So the plus means uh, the, 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 the public. We're gonna discuss UML in, in a few lectures. And what this, um, uh, look at this HTTP socket rectangle. What do these two small rectangles on the left, what do they mean? You see, I saw, I, I draw this, this, this HTTP socket and I call it, I, I put these two small, this horizontal rectangles there. Try again, interface, no, not interface. This is component, this is how UML presents components. 
So if the rectangle has these two things on the right, on the, on the left, or on the right, then this whole thing is component. It's called a component. It's an element from the component diagram. So actually this diagram is kind of a mess because it's wrong. So UML way, I combine elements from two different diagrams. I combine classes with component. You cannot do that. And even with the deployments element. So database is an element of deployment. Uh, component is an element of component diagram. And classes are elements of class diagram. So that's diagram is UML speaking, strictly speaking, that's the wrong diagram. But for the understanding, that's good enough. So I show you how to do object-oriented programming right. Well, better. Maybe not completely entirely right, but better. Uh, the same two objects, the database with the same two methods, the same object HTML, the same database, the same HTTP socket, but now the entry point is not to some controller. There's no controller anymore. The entry point is to the HTML object. So somebody who wants to render something, it comes to HTML and says render probably. And then the HTML goes with the request to the database. From the database, the response comes back, which is the data, and then the whole operation happens. So rendering happens. And then I put this green line on top of these two objects. So I can, I'm connecting the HTML to the database. And who can explain what this green line means with these two numbers, one and one? This is UML. You told me you studied UML, right? Dependency, no, it's not exactly dependency, it's composition. Composition means that this, this uh, diamond, the solid diamond on this line, the line is solid, the diamond is solid, and the number is one and one. That means that HTML object has one object database somewhere inside. So it kind of owns the object database. So HTML owns the database. On the previous picture, they were two independent objects. HTML is independent from the database. And there was somebody on top who is the controller. The controller probably owned them both. Or maybe not even owned, but connected to them and found them through some mechanism and then you know, work with them. In this way, we make one object own another object. And this way, we make a more complex object and avoid the, the, the controlling part. I'm not sure that this is entirely clear, but just try to, uh, probably you'll understand it a bit later. The red lines here demonstrate how the flow of data should never happen. I think this is clear. So we should never let HTML go to the database. We should never let database go to HTTP. So we always want objects to encapsulate what they encapsulate and ne never allow other objects to talk to what they encapsulate. I mean, this should not happen. So this is more like separation of concerns or maybe uh, this is encapsulation. So object-oriented programming was, is done so wrong in many cases. Who is using uh, web frameworks? in your real programming life. What kind of frameworks do you use? Spring for, dot for, Spring for Java, yeah? What else? Uh, pl Flask? Django. ASP.net? <laughs> OK. So when you will eventually start using web frameworks, and you will if you will become programmers, then you will have controllers there. You will be taught that uh, the controller is the core element of a uh, web framework. Actually, most frameworks, or all frameworks, they're designed with the concept, with the architectural paradigm or pattern called MVC, Model View Controller. So the controller is the key element of MVC pattern, which is, in my opinion, is a big, big, big mistake in object-oriented programming. So controllers are objects which control other objects. Instead, objects must control themselves. And I'll show you now uh, with more details why it happens. So we have two object-oriented programming. One is done wrong, one is done right. And in a few minutes, we'll jump into more specific details, why wrong and one right. So if you make the code elegant, let's call it this object-oriented code, then your code will look like this. Instead of overlapping each other, instead of letting the controller control whatever objects they, they, they can control, you will have the structure like this. Objects will be encapsulated into objects, encapsulated into objects, making composite objects. Larger and larger and larger objects. So your entire application ideally should be one large object with encapsulated other objects. And then each 
each object in, on a deeper level encapsulates more objects and more and more. And then when you need some data, when you need something to be done, then you come to the higher level object, you ask to do this for you, and then the request goes down and down to the deeper level of objects which are nested into the large one. That's the idea. In this case, I'm suggesting that objects should not communicate like this. They should communicate only to the objects which own them, which are, which are owning them, and then to objects which are beneath them. So rectangles represent? Like modules, yeah. For example, large rectangles, are, we can call them modules, but I prefer to, prefer to call them objects. So large rectangles are also objects, but large objects. For example, one big object which is called application. And then the smaller object, which is called database, pool of database connections. Another object is like screen, where you draw something. Another one. Is this a guard object? Is what? Is this a guard object? The guard, guard object? No, no, guard object is the object which has many methods. We will talk about guard object in, in probably next lecture. So guard object is the object with many, many methods. Here we have large object with a few objects that are being encapsulated. Look how many, imagine that this, the full rectangle is one big object. So how many objects are inside? Just four. So it doesn't look like God object. God object is the object which has, I don't know, 100 methods and then uh, 200 attributes. But in this case, we have four attributes, which are encapsulated objects, and maybe one, two, three methods. It is difficult. I understand the question that eventually we will have to somehow overlap. Yeah, so some objects will need to talk to other objects, yeah, eventually. But it is possible to make it that they don't do that. So it's possible to make it that the object which stays inside my object doesn't talk to objects across. They only talk to who is the owner and only talk to objects who are beneath. So all the objects can be designed in a hierarchy. They should. The whole the hierarchy of objects. Object, under object, under object, under object. And they never talk like if there's a two different trees, so they don't talk like this, unless this object is encapsulated there as well. So when my object is here, it doesn't mean that I cannot encapsulate somebody from here as well. So I encapsulate it, but I don't talk to a random object. For example, like people do this dependency injection containers. When you pass this in dependency injection container to different places, and then anybody can just go to the container, take whatever it is there, anything, and just talk to it. This is, this is what I'm against. So we always want to, yeah. Um, in the previous examples, uh, we had a similar instrument and a database, and they are all different to each other. Yeah. If here, yeah. if HTML talks to database, yeah, in this, this, this case is correct, but database is a child of HTML. It's a child. It's a, it's a child project, so a child object. So HTML is the owner and database is the child because of this green line on top. Because before we didn't have this green line, you see, they were independent, independent two objects, and then we need somebody on top to control what's going on with them. So we take the data from one object and we put data to another object. So the data flies through us, the data flies through the controller, and that's wrong. So we don't want data to fly across the system. We want data to stay as close as possible to where it's needed. Here, the HTML here, database is there, it talks to the kid, and that's it. I ask you for the data, you give me the data, I use it, and it's all inside, encapsulated inside HTML object. So that's why this uh, green line, which overall, if you look at this picture, for example, on the left corner, left top corner, this is database and HTML around. Kids, parents, more parents, more parents, and eventually the hierarchy of objects. That's what I think is right. So why this miscon I mean, misconception, why people were thinking that objects are just uh, you know, places where data can be stored and then some procedures is because uh, this is the definition of the object which was given by so many books. I actually gonna quote you six different places, sources of information. The first one, um, the famous book by, um, about C++, the, found, the creator of C++. I suggested this book to you before to read it. Um, 
The book says an object is some memory that holds a value of some type. So basically this definition of the object came to us from procedural programming. C++ calls int an object? You sure? Okay, I understand. So you're saying that an object and a class do different things in C++, and in this quote, we're only speaking specifically about objects, not classes. And int is, integer is also an object. Maybe, I'm not sure about that, but the definition uh, of an object sounds like this. So they call an object not something which is uh, like a thing which encapsulates something and we're gonna talk to this thing like the original creators of object-oriented programming with, were, were uh, expecting to make. They think an object is just a piece of memory, which is technically true. In C++ is technically true. In C++ an object is uh, actually a, uh, a uh, place in memory where you can store a number, a string, another number, another string, and then call these places attributes. So this is the object called, for example, employee, and then there's a name, age, and uh, I don't know, a salary. So there are like fields in an object, which is uh, technically correct, but conceptually, I think it 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 it, it um, uh, redirects it us to the wrong to the wrong direction. The second quote is from Wikipedia. The Wikipedia says that objects may contain data in the form of fields, often known as attributes, and code in the form of procedures, often known as methods. So basically this is a definition given by Wikipedia, which is, which is the, I think it's kind of quite procedural definition of objects. So, uh, which is, uh, uh, which again tells us that an object is just a temporary holder of data. It's a temporary place where the data can 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 be uh, can be stored, and there are methods which we can ask to deal with the data somehow. And technically, it may be true for some programming languages, but overall, it doesn't really help us to design objects. Like I said, it doesn't really help us to think about objects as mm, you know as independent you know creatures, entities, which are as it has to be done in object-oriented programming, they are supposed to be responsible for their own behavior, for their own life cycle, for their own life, for everything. So we're not supposed to know what's inside of an object. So this idea of us knowing what's going on in the object and knowing to the very little detail, like here, may contain data in the form of fields. So it's very technical definition of objects, which kind of, abu kind of abusive and kind of, uh, you know, in re <laughs> irrespectful to, to those little creatures. The second quote is um, coming from Smalltalk, another language. Who ever heard about Smalltalk? Do you know about it? Who was the developer of this? Who created the Smalltalk? Do you know? Which company? Who were the people? Yes, I think it's Apple. Yes, I'm sure. So this language which was originally designed by Apple, and this is why most people believe, including myself, why the Apple user interface was so great, was so far ahead, any other company, uh, you know, at that time. So because of small talk, because it was object-oriented programming. So because having object-oriented programming, Apple was able to make graphic user interface so attractive, so fast, and so uh, responsive to users. And then Windows uh, started to enter the market, and then the whole idea ruined. But Apple originally designed very good interface and very, you know, very good programming language, Smalltalk. But still, if you read the book about Smalltalk, the book will tell you that an object consists of some private memory instead of operations. So even a book about a good programming language where object-oriented programming is supposed to be done right, they also say the same. An object consists of some memory and some set of operations. It's still procedural. It's still like places of code, some data, so when we come to the object, we expect the data to be there, we expect the procedures to be called, so then we get back to the original paradigm. So there's a controller here, I come to you, work with the data, return me the data, and I go somewhere else with this data again. The next quote, I'm getting more and more closer and closer to the right definition of an object, which unfortunately is not so popular, but it exists. The second is uh, from Java in a nutshell. Very good book, actually. Uh, it's a seventh edition already. I suggest to read it, even though it's quite big. And the majority of the book is just re like uh, reference information about the Java JDK, which is, in my opinion, 
not so valuable for the book. Um, so this, this book says a class is a collection of data fields that hold values and methods that operate on those fields. Again, collection of fields, data, methods, quite technical. This one is better, Thinking, Thinking in Java. This is a book actually I recommend you to read. Thinking in Java, Bruce Eckel, um, quite good you know, understanding of object-oriented programming, quite good explanation about Java. So if somebody asks me to one book about Java to read, I suggest this book. I suggest this book to, to understand Java. So the book says, each object, each object looks quite a bit like a little computer. It has a state, it has some operations. You can ask it to perform. That's much better, like a little computer. So you don't say that an object is a piece of memory. You don't say it's a piece of operations. You say it's a little computer. So we don't know what's inside. We don't know how the computer works. We don't know what kind of data is in there. We just know that we can ask this computer to perform some operations for us. This is a much better definition of an object, which may lead to object thinking, which is the title of this lecture. So object thinking, actually the title of the lecture is by the title of the book, which I love very much and I strongly recommend you to read. This is probably the best book I read about software development, software engineering by David West. Um, an object is an uh, equivalent of the quanta from the universe is construct, from which the universe is constructed. So David West is quite a philosophical book. In this book you will find no code, almost no, maybe like a few a few pages maybe with the code. Even the book is quite big. So the book tells you about how to think about objects. There are many quotes from researchers. There are many philosophical discussions about how you design the software, how you think about, how you think as in terms of objects, not in terms of uh, procedures. Even the, I actually, on my YouTube channel, I have an interview with David West. I uh, interviewed him about this subject general programming a few years ago in, in America. Uh, you, can, you can find it. It's quite quite interesting uh, researcher and um, very interesting person in the area of software engineering. So in this book, he actually, I, after reading this book, I kind of opened my, my eyes for, for the Java code I, I, I was writing. And that will happen probably seven or eight years ago. And after that, everything changed. So I started to write software differently. In my opinion, much better. So he says that we don't know anything about an object. We don't know what's inside an object. We don't want to know. We don't want to treat it as a collection of data fields, a collection of procedures and methods. We just take it as a quant quanta, like something, so we build the universe out of these objects. We connect them, one object, another one, and a larger object, a larger one, a larger one, and then eventually the whole universe is built. So thinking like this will help you. It, it doesn't look very practical. We will jump to practical things after the break, which we're going to have now. Uh, I will show you practically what needs to be changed in your code so that you start thinking like, like object. But for now, just believe that uh, that object thinking is the way to go. So you should think of objects as something, well, at least like this, at least like computers, but ideally as something which you have no idea what's inside. So every time you design an object, you make it like a closed black box, never allowing anyone, ideally not allowing anyone to take the data out of an object. So the object must not be the storage of data, must not be something where you place the data and then you take the data out. An object is something which you, where you come to, ask for some service, they, the object gives you the service, and then you walk away with some result of the service. Not the data which you will bring to another object, but the result of the service. How to build such a software, that's quite difficult. I mean, using the current languages we have. But we will discuss it after the break. Now we get to more practical stuff, which is uh, which is three most evil parts of object oriented programming. Actually, there are more, you know, there are many evil things in, in, in modern object oriented programming, but I decided to pick three of them and show you more practical. The first one is called uh, static methods. I'm not sure you can see it from there, but you should. So I give you two examples. Something wrong with my QR code. So I'm giving you two examples. The first one on the left is the um, how. Uh, the code would look with static methods, and on the right is without static methods. Who knows what is a static method? Okay, half of you, maybe all of you. you all of you have to know, of course, if you are programmers. So the static method is sometimes also called class method, and the method which, we, which is called 
even though it stays in the class, even though it exists in the class, it is defined in the class, in Java, in Ruby, in whatever language you, you call it, in, in C++, it doesn't belong to the class. It doesn't belong, I mean, it doesn't belong to objects which are instantiated in the class. It does belong to the class, but it doesn't have to do anything with the objects instantiated because it doesn't have this or self or whatever. So no pointer to the real object. It's just a method, it's just a procedure which is, instead of being global and being, vis being visible in the global scope, the procedure is visible only inside the class, which makes it a little bit more encapsulated, a little bit more isolated, uh, but, uh, uh, but doesn't uh, really make it, uh, you know, make, doesn't really help object-oriented programming. So, uh, so I believe that static methods is one of the most, the biggest terrible mistakes we made while we were designing uh, programming languages. Java, C++, all of the programming languages, they, most of them, I don't know many languages that don't have static method. Why it's wrong? What's wrong with static method? You have this, URL, this uh, QR code which points to the blog post I wrote probably seven years ago about this. It explains the details, but briefly explaining what's wrong with static methods. Static methods, when they exist, they return us back to procedural programming. So they are just like procedures. What's wrong with procedures? Procedures expect us to give them all the data, so-called naked data or open data, which we take somewhere, we give it to the static method, the static method makes the process of the data and returns us back the data. It doesn't have a place to store the data. It doesn't have a place, it doesn't have a state inside. It doesn't have an object. It doesn't have, it doesn't, it is not connected to anywhere. It is just a piece of code, just algorithm. The algorithm which can only manipulate with the data which is coming in and coming out, which, which returns us back to procedural programming, which in the first place was a bad idea because data was flying over the, the code, the procedures were inter interlapping like this, and data was open to everybody. There was no encapsulation. Object-oriented programming introduced encapsulation. Object-oriented programming said, okay, you don't know about my data. You only know about my behavior. So you look at me, you ask me to do something for you, I'll do it for you, but don't touch my data and minimize the amount of data which flies in and flies out. So that's why in object-oriented programming, your methods should be as short as possible. I mean, the amount of parameters. Ideally, maybe one or zero parameters. And ideally, you don't return much data back. So you don't return like large pieces of data. You return like the status, true, false, maybe a number, one, two, three, in, in a good object-oriented code. So if your method returns a lot, then you're doing something wrong. If your method expects a lot, like many parameters, like three, four parameters, then you're doing something very wrong. It has to be a small amount of parameters and a quick response. Everything else is encapsulated. They don't need to know what's going on inside. They don't need to see your, they don't need to transfer data outside of object borders. That's the idea. And static methods, they completely ruin this idea. They just make, they just say, okay, we're just an algorithm. I don't have state. I'm not an object. Just send me the data. I'll make the process of the data. And then I give you the data back. And then you deal with this data. What happens is data moves from place to place in the software, and the software becomes less maintainable. Uh, that's, that's what's going on. How to, yeah. What's the point of finding some method that can be static as, I mean, the non-static one is done, how is it called? There are two options. The method could be static, and it could be, uh, it's called object method. Object method, yeah. So I got, I got the question, I got the question. So the question is, what if we don't really need an object? What if we just need an algorithm, which will, for, for example, compare two numbers and select the largest one, right? So we don't have self. Then our design is wrong. So that's an indicator of something is going wrong with the design. So for example, that's a real example. We have two numbers, A and B, and we want to compare and return what's, what's bigger, right? Simple method, which we'll call max, for example, maximum. So this, is, this design is not object-oriented. If you say max, A, B. The right design is, who can answer this? What would be the right design, the object-oriented design? Serious, again? Exactly, A dot max B. So the right design is to move the method max into the object A, and then pass the parameter B into the object A. And even the better design would be 
which you probably cannot guess, but the right design, the perfect design, would be to introduce a new object, I call it max, and then encapsulate two objects into it, A and B. And then max will become a new number, which is the maximum. So we had two quantas, and then we build a larger universe. We build a third quanta. We had number, number, and now we have the third number, which behaves like the maximum. This is object-oriented thinking. Sure. Yes. Okay, you're, you're asking like if it's a simple function, so why making the whole class out of it, right? If it's just a simple function max, so why making the whole class which will do this thing? That's a very typical question. People think that more classes means uh, less maintainable code. They think, okay, why do I need to make uh, one, two, three, five classes? Instead of I can make just one class, sometimes they're called utility class, and then I put just five functions in there. Let's call them, let's call them static methods. And it's gonna be very useful utility class pattern. Probably you know about this. They call it a design pattern, utility class. So it's basically a collection of algorithm, collection of static methods, and we call it a day. We can do that, but strategically it's not into it's not the object-oriented programming by, by definition. It's, not the, it's the wrong paradigm, the, long, the wrong thing. Because you, you, th you think that way, you start going that direction, and you will, get, you will have more and more static methods, more and more static methods. Eventually, all your code will be just many, many static methods. And then you get back to GW basic, which we started from. So you have like procedures, 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 no objects, no need to encapsulate, nothing. The right object-oriented design, again, think about this. I actually wrote about this uh, in the book and in the blog that in this example, specifically this, maximum two numbers, A and B. We, we take one number, another number, and then we born, we make a new object, which is the maximum. We don't calculate. It's also, it's also um, uh, a difference in paradigm, you probably know about this, imperative and declarative programming. Who, who ever heard about this? Imperative and declarative. It's a different thing, like a few people know. Imperative programming, when you tell the computer what to do and it does it for you right now, right here. For example, maximum, you call max, this is five, this is three, okay, return me five. The computer starts working immediately. It immediately goes to the, cent to the CPU, it, it calculates the difference, five and three, compares them and says, okay, five is bigger and five goes back to you immediately. This is imperative programming. Declarative programming is when you say, you know what, how about you make a new number which will behave like the biggest between five and three. And the computer says, okay, I'll do it for you, but no calculation. We have this number, but you didn't ask me to do anything with the number, so I didn't ask CPU to do anything. I just compi The compiler just says, okay, you have this number. And then we ask this number, how about you add one to yourself? This new number plus one. At this point of time, the calculation starts. The computer says, okay, five compared to three, oh, that is five, plus one, six. But until you ask this plus, plus one, nothing happens. It's just declaratively created as a new object, which just exists, but doesn't do anything. So it's like a lazy calculations. Probably you've heard about this term as well, lazy calculations. Like you build objects, you make object into object, into object, into object, and then eventually you say, eventually you say this large object, how about you start working for me? And then the calculation starts. It's a very typical question. Yeah, I got the question. So the question is what happens if we have many, many operations and we need to calculate this max, I don't know, 15, 15, 5 million times a second. And each object creation, each making new object will actually take more resources than just comparing five and three. Of course, this is a problem. Of course it will happen. Of course, working with object is more expensive operation than just making calculations. Why? Because programming languages, which we have right now, we're never, thinking about objects. They were just making these objects just like a, you know, convenient tools or utils for programmers, but not really giving us the new paradigm. So they didn't design compilers right. 
So if the compiler would be right, or the language would be right, designed, then making an object and comparing this number would eventually compile to as fast instructions as just a normal compiling. You know, so probably some optimizations, some, com some compilation techniques. So eventually, if, we, if computer science would go that direction, you know, in object-oriented way, then they would make us compilers and languages which would make objects fast, as fast as static methods. But now in reality, static methods, even, you know, it's a very typical example, even in Android, and Android SDK, if you read Android SDK made by Google, then Google recommends programmers, like explicitly saying that please don't use objects, use static methods, because they're faster. Because on Android, everything will work faster if you use in your Java code or now Kotlin code, you use static methods instead of objects. So they recommend programmers, don't do objects, don't think like, you know, in object-oriented way. Just do, uh, just, uh, just do it in a static way. So that's the whole, you know, the whole industry is now against us, against people who want to think as objects. Yeah. Why do we need object-oriented programming? Yeah, why do we need declarative? Okay, that's a good question. So we have imperative programming and declarative programming. Why do we need declarative? Why can't we do everything imperative? Because imperative programming is much more difficult to understand for people and much less maintainable. Because when you do imperative programming, you always need to stay in charge of what's going on. You control the flow of executions and you cannot make larger abstractions. So that's, that's what you know, procedural programming was originally. So you need to like, think in your, in your brain. You need to flow the, the flow of instructions, getting, thinking like a computer. Thinking like, okay, five goes in here, three comes back, then that, this, go, this goes left, this goes right, so I put it together. This is, I think, like an execution, like a computer. When you do declarative programming, you think, okay, I have this and I have that. They together are a new number. Okay, then I put it together like this, then I combine it with this, then I combine it with this, and then all of a sudden it works. So I don't know exactly how it works. I don't think like a, you know, like step-by-step -step execution. I don't think in the terms of operators and statements. I think in concepts, in, in concepts, in, in abstractions. So this is the car, this is the garage. There are five cars in the garage. They stay in there, like okay, how much the garage costs. And the garage starts calculating the cost. It's not like me saying, take the price of the car, take the price of the car, take the price, summarize them. Okay, this is the cost of the garage. I just know that the garage is an aggregation of five cars. And then how much is the garage? And boom, the calculation happens. When I ask for the price. Imperative programming is like I go and calculate step by step. Declarative is I build something and then this something which I build actually knows what is the price. Yeah, if we go into low-level programming, then you will somehow, at some point, need to jump from object-oriented programming to procedural. Because computers, they don't know what are objects. Computers think in, in terms of instructions. Computers know only computer, like, you know, opcodes. So they need, like, they need real explicit instructions. Computers don't know about objects. They need to move data from place to place. That's all they can do, computers. But so at some point, you need to transfer from object-oriented thinking, of object thinking, to procedural thinking. And it's better that this transition will be done by compilers, not by people. So we people should stay with the objects. We should stay thinking like things from the real world. And computers should think about operations and data and how they move the data from register to register. But in, when we use static methods, then we move to this territory. We start thinking as computers. And that makes the code less maintainable. Okay, let's continue. We have more. Um, next one is mutability versus immutability. Who knows what is immutability in object-oriented programming? Immutability. Who can explain briefly? Changeable versus non-changeable. Non Each change requires recreation of object. That's good. Actually, I don't know what immutability means in modern programming languages because there are many you know, definitions. For example, we have this deep immutability or, or shallow immutability. We have immutability through, uh, for example, who knows Java? Like how many of you understand Java? Okay, no, it's not about Java. Let's say we have an object and then in the object we have attribute and the attribute is an array. So the attribute is final, but this is an array. So even the attribute though is attribute is final, I can still store some data into array. 
So is it immutable object or mutable? Nobody knows. It's hard to say. So, uh, but there is one thing which is a very dirty mutability, is the class, for example, in Java or object in some other programming language, where the attribute is changeable, replaceable, after the object is created. So you had an object, you make an object, you make it born with the constructor or whatever you have, and then the object has, for example, it's a car, so the car has the, the price and the car has the model, so I make the car, it's a Chevrolet, and then the price is $5,000. I have an object, and then I go to this car and say, set price. And I change the price to $4,000. So, and the price is replaced. So the price was originally the number, and then I get in there and change the price. So that is mutability. And mutability, yeah. This is actually a bad example, because price of car changes. Inside. Price of car changes, but I'm talking about the attribute, which changes not change the data in a database, but changes in the memory, changes um, the value which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the attribute of an object. So the object, this is mutability. I mean, we're not saying just now, we're just now not, um, let's, let's get away a little bit about what's good and bad. Let's just finish the discussion, what is mutability, what is immutability. So in this case, it's mutable. The car is mutable because we can change the price. We can say set price. And immutable car would be, like we were said before, we can make a new car and say, okay, that was the old car, car one, and then we make a new car, and in the new car, the price is different. So first example is mutable car, where we just use the same object, we set the value there, we set the attribute. Another example, when we make the new object, and then the new object is a different car. So in immutable programming, for example, functional programming is mostly about immutable things, immutability. So every time you need to make something new, you make a copy of it, which is a different object. So every time, every modification leads to a different object, to a new object. So you never touch the object which is already created. After creation, the object is not touched. So I believe that uh, having mutability, having objects which are changeable in Java, in object-oriented programming, is a bad idea in general. It's better to work with immutable you know, objects. By immutability here, I mean objects which, allow, which do not allow their attributes to be replaced. They, they allow the data to come through. For example, I'm the object which represents a car and the, and the data I keep in the database. So my only attribute is the location of the database. So I know that my ID in the database is 113. And every time you come to me and set set price, then I go to the database and I change the database the price. But I stay always connected to the same record, the same record in the database, 113. So I never change this, this link. You cannot come to me and say, you know, from now on, you're linked to the, to the raw 114 database. No, I'm always attached to 113 in the database. That's my, Im that's my immutability. And why it's good, I actually um, made a list of uh, benefits of immutability, which is, uh, again, from the blog post. Um, it uh, explains that uh, there are many, many benefits uh, which uh, immutability gives you, but uh, at least... The second one, for example, well, the first one, immutable objects are simpler to construct, test, and use. So when you code in immutable objects, then your objects will be, by definition, smaller. Objects will be smaller. That's a very big virtue. It's a, it's a super important benefit of, uh, in, in any programming, object-oriented, non-object-oriented. The smaller your code, the smaller your scope of visibility, the better for everybody. So when your object is immutable, you cannot make it large because every time you need to copy it, if you want to make uh, another object which is the same, well, the, like this one, but with, with some modifications, so you will have to make uh, you will have to make changes, and it's difficult to make them if the object is mutable is um, immutable. The second one is um, uh, truly immutable objects are always thread safe. Who knows about the thread safety problem? One, two, three, many of you actually. So now you understand. So when the object is not thread safe, then it's a potential source for many, many troubles uh, with debugging, with testing, with everything. So ideally objects uh, you know, have to be thread safe. Make them immutable, they are by definition thread safe. Immutable objects, if they're truly immutable, like deeply immutable, which you can read by yourself what it means, then it will be very uh, easy to, uh, to guarantee thread safety. There are many other things like no side effects, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is, uh, which is you can learn by yourself why it's good. So in general, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, you provide an example of a immutable card which stores its ID in the database. But uh, it's by setting the price, for example, to produce a side effect. Yeah. When you set to the database, there is no side effect. Why? Because by side effect, I mean, what is the side effect? Side effect is something like this. Um, let's say it's a car, and you are the function somewhere. So I give you the car, and I ask you, uh, tell me, is it affordable by you or not? You take the car, you take get price, you see 5,000, you say, no, I have only, user has only 4.5 thousand, so you return false, for example. Side effect is I give you the car, you check the price, and then you set the price and return me the car. And that's a side effect. Because your description of your method never said anything like that. But you did it. Why? Because that's the way you designed your method. Because, I mean, some mistake there, some bug. Let's say there's a bug in your method. But this bug is yours, but I will get a side effect. I give you my object. I don't expect this object to be modified. But then it comes back to me with a side effect that while you were doing your calculations, you damaged my object. If my object is immutable, then I send it to you. You never can change the, anything in the object. You always, you don't touch it. You only return me true or false. Yes, but in this uh, immutable car example, we still have this uh, method uh, set cost, set price. Sorry. Yeah. Which was changed in data in database. So how do you achieve this immutability? In this case, it, you can still, you can still change the database. That's right. Yeah, but it's not going to be in this case. Okay, you, can, you may say it's still the side effect, yeah? Still sounds like a side effect. It clearly is, you consider the definition of side effect maybe from some, I don't know, bunch of programming group, introduction to customers. Probably I need, I need a better explanation of the side effect here, yeah. Um, let's discuss it separately, but I agree, you're, you're good point, yeah, it's still going to be, it's still possible, it's still possible to, to ask the object to do something which I'm not expecting you to, to ask the object to do. Okay, all right, we'll discuss it. We need to move further. The next one, uh, the number three problem is null. Null is a large null, null, I don't know what's the right way to say it, probably null. So null references are uh, big trouble, which is, uh, which was inherited from, no, it's not a problem? In Java we have null, in, in Python we have it, in Ruby we have it. Pro, okay, is, this is not really relevant, it exists in other languages, you mean? Yeah. So you're saying that null is a problem in other languages too, not only object-oriented programming? Or? To object orientation, yeah. Okay, that fair point. Yeah, I agree. Fair point. So this is this problem is not only for object oriented programming. You may have object, you may have null in other programming languages, but in object oriented programming, it kind of, I mean, for me, it kind of shines a lot because instead of objects, all of a sudden you may have null. So you're expecting an object, you're expecting a car, you're expecting a user, and then the null comes in. And when null comes in, like in this example, for example, um, you, you, this is the, the function, the method, whatever, where we're supposed to find an employee at the database. And I go to the database, I try to find the ID, and the ID is not found, the ID is zero, and then I return null. So instead of returning employee, Java, this is Java code, Java allows me to return null. Return something which is not an object, and if somebody will try to talk to this employee later, then there will be a, a runtime exception, null pointer exception, or in C++ there will be segmentation fault. So the user who is asking me for this, uh, for this employee will never know what's coming out. The user will expect the real object to come out, but the null will get back. And that will lead to so popular problem called null pointer exception, for example, in Java. Actually, there was a very popular, very famous uh, lecture made by Tony, uh, Tony Huar, um, 
It's called Null References, the, mil the Billion Dollar Mistake. So he seems to be the inventor of this Null in the language which I'm not sure which one, I'm not gonna say, but the language which was before C++, before Java, that was one of the languages which he created. And in this language, he introduced this null, that's what he says. And he believes that that was the huge billion dollar mistake for the whole industry. Maybe not one billion, but billions of dollars mistake for, for programming. Watch the lecture, it's very interesting. You can Google it and find it. So this is the third problem in object-oriented programming. Again, if you program it right, then you will get rid of that. You will have not now. We discussed this uh, just in the break. We discussed what happens with the construction of objects. If you do it wrong, if you let, if you can, if you, if you need, sometimes you need to use now in order to do wrong design. So every time when you deal with now, if you have the code like this, stop for a second and think why you're doing this. Maybe you're doing it wrong. I wanted to suggest you a solution, which is called null object on the next slide. Take a look at it, it's called null object. So sometimes you need to return, like in this example, return something from database. One of the solutions is called, actually there are two solutions. The first one is called null object. So uh, when you don't find anything, you return an object, which is called employee, for example, in this case, it's like a constant object, employee, nobody. So you return an object, which is still a valid object, which is still an employee, but when somebody starts doing something with this object, the object gonna behave differently, not like a normal employee. So for example, you are looking for the employee by the name, by the guy who was fired already, not with us anymore. We return the object, which is called fired guy, then the name is there. And when you, for example, ask what's the name of this person, which you just returned, you're gonna get the name. It's not null, you're gonna get the real name. But if those who got the object will start talking to this object and saying, for example, do this job for me, then the object will raise an exception and say, you know what, I was fired two months ago. So this null object will behave differently comparing to the normal object. That's, the, that's called, this is the design pattern, which is called null object. That's one solution for, for the problem of null. The second solution is called fail fast. Who knows fail fast? It's the combination of words. You have to know, it's, it's, there's a very fundamental concept in software development, fail fast against fail safe. So this solution, which we had previously, this one, is called fail safe. So the program, when the, the, the error is happening, the program is trying to save the situation, to restore the situation, to, to do whatever is possible to not to crash. For example, here, you're asking me for the employee, which I cannot find in a database. It's an error situation. But the program says, you know, I'm not gonna crash now, I'm gonna return you null. So it's not my problem, deal with the problem later. So this is called fail safe. So Try to be as safe as possible. The alternative approach is to immediately throw an exception. You ask me for the employee, I'm not gonna protect the situation, I'm not gonna try to save it, I'm gonna crash immediately. And this approach is called fail fast. So fail as fast as possible. And that's a very good approach to programming. So fail safe will lead you to really bad code, to programs which will fail in a bad way. You have to design with the fail fast in mind. So the moment you find problem in the code, the moment you find some wrong situation, you immediately throw an exception. You don't try to, you don't try to protect your user. You don't try to protect, I mean, the user who, who came to you for, for the data, for the object. So you throw an exception immediately. That's called fail fast. Uh, 
the developer's fulfillment, I just uh, pass it to pass it, uh, them because I don't want to uh, process it. And then it happens that uh, this exception tells the main and the program crashes. But if we save it to some more object, that will go uh, and maybe even will be shown on the user interface, but it will be like user user, the program won't crash. Uh, Yes, of course, there, 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 is a, there is a thin line between this approach when you have new objects, when you return something that the program will not crash immediately, but maybe later or maybe never. In this case, the program will crash always because no matter what happens, if the wrong name is there, if we cannot find it in the database, the program will crash. I suggest to lean towards fail fast as much as you can. Of course, sometimes you do it like this. Sometimes you do null objects. But strategically speaking, think about this. The more exceptions you throw, the more stable in the end your program will be. That may, th it may sound counter like counterintuitive, but the, the philosophy is this. You make as many exceptions in your code as possible. In all error situations, and all even situations which may be not even error, but they look like error situations, you throw exceptions as much as possible. That will lead to a lot of crashes of your code during the testing phase during the initial deployments, during the initial delivery of your code to your users. It will crash a lot and a lot. And every time it will crash, you will fix the code, you will improve the code at the places where it's easy to do. Because you will see that exceptions are flying from the really you know, places where there, there are root causes of the problem, like here. You will know what's going on. You will get an exception, the user will send you the stack trace and will say, you know what? It, was, it failed in this line specifically. You'll say, no problem, you just go to this line, you fix the line, you understand what's going on, if the user is not found, you fix this line immediately. So your code becomes more, and every time you add a test, every time you add, we're gonna test about, we're gonna talk about unit testing much later in a few lectures, but you will, every time you're gonna add more tests, more tests, you will cover your code with more and more tests. The more bugs you get from the users, the more tests you write, the more stable your code becomes. If you hide, on the other hand, if you hide the information about failures, if you try to protect your users during the development, then initially you will have not so many bugs. The amount of bugs will be quite small in the beginning. Users will be more or less happy, but the more users will get, the more, the bigger the amount of bugs, and the more unstable your code will become. And eventually it will be a dead project. So think, read about this. We can talk about this for hours, but read about fail fast philosophy. That's the URL. You can go to my blog. On the blog, you will find many links to, and the link to original uh, article which was published about fail fast. So we can say a few words about domain-driven design, and then we're getting close to the end. Um, domain-driven design. Domain-driven design is about giving objects the right names. That's how I understand domain-driven design. So they just say that in order to name objects, and this is actually a huge problem in object-oriented programming, how to give names to objects. When you will start writing real code, you will see that this is a really, really big problem. Sometimes, I can tell you honestly, sometimes I spend three hours, four hours, like half a day when I start new project, thinking about how to give names to two, three objects. Because the good naming, the right naming, the, in the invention of good names for your objects is actually, in my opinion, it's like, it's half, I don't know, it, it's 60% of your success of your design of, of, of the software. So if you give your objects right name, and if you understand, okay, this is gonna be the table, this is gonna be the chair, this is gonna be the car, the garage, that's how they get connected, that's like the, the problem is solved. I'm telling you, I spend sometimes days on, on, on understanding what are the good names. And the main driven design was actually a solution, invented as a solution for this problem. So how about instead of thinking and making up names and giving names like controller, uh, storage, uh, pool of data, factory, all of these names are nothing in the real world. They suggest that we give names to objects just the way they are named in real world. A table, a chair, a computer, a cup, uh, a pencil, a pen, and so on and so forth. So if you follow this principle of design, then you open your software, and if you see the class which is named not like something in the real world, then your classes probably should be renamed and you should redesign your software. By real world, I mean the world which surrounds your software. It doesn't necessarily need to be a table or a chair. Sometimes it could be a TCP IP connection. It could be a socket. It could be a file. It could be a, uh, I don't know, a line in the file. But everything which is around your code, all these real objects in real life, 
they have to be named the same way in your code. That's the main driven design. That's how I understand it. Yes. No, I answered the question. Okay. So we get finally we get to elegant objects. Okay, elegant objects was um, uh, was this is the link to the website. You can go elegantobjects.org. So it, we started about uh, seven years ago as a concept. Uh, we already published two books about this. Uh, I made I published two books. I made about forty speeches about this. I wrote about eighty blog posts. You can read them all. Uh, we made not me but. Many people actually participate in this. We made about more than 30 different frameworks and libraries, which are designed with this parad paradigm in, in, in mind. No null, no static methods, no mutable objects, and many, many other no's. Uh, we got a website where more than 50 people already registered like fans, so people like really love that. They, they get registered there. They, they, they say, okay, we support this idea. Uh, we know, I know, at least I know, at least six bloggers who read, who write about this like frequently. At least these three, I can recommend you to read this blog post aside from mine, which which write about this uh, this idea. And we already managed to organize five object thinking meetups. Two of them in California, three in Moscow. Maybe we'll organize one in Indianapolis. If one of you would like to help us organize it, come to me. We'll make it. Uh, and you can see them online, they're all recorded, where people are presenting their ideas about how to design, how to do object-oriented programming better. Uh, I gave you uh, four QR codes for four lectures, which four presentations, which I made at conferences uh, about object-oriented programming. So everything I said to you today, I said many times in at least these four presentations are the most, uh, I mean, I love them more than, than everybody, than, than, sorry, not everybody else, but... <laughs> Like everything else, like others. <laughs> so I like these four presentations, these QR codes, they're clickable. Actually, I'll send you the, the PDF of the presentation later. Uh, and what we do now, we are making a new language, which we call EOLang. So EOLang is the new programming language. This is the code, how it looks, uh, which, is, which doesn't have all the problems which we believe Java has in C++ and many other programming languages, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, Go. So we make a new programming language which is supposed to be better than other languages. If you want to join and help us, then I have some interesting tasks for you. For example, if you want to help. For example, we are interested to make compilers from our language, the new one, to JavaScript, Go, Rust, Ruby, we already have compilers to Java. We already have compilers to Python. So other languages are welcome. So if you're interested to join, to participate, to contribute, it could be your diploma work. It could be your, I mean, along with your study. Come to me, we'll talk, and one of these tasks may become your, your project, subject of your, of your future work. Second one, we are looking for REPL. REPL is, uh, who knows what it is? REPL is the like a command line stuff when you, I don't know, don't remember how to, uh, what this REPL stands for, but it's actually when you uh, type the, the instruction, you hit enter and the machine calculates it, translates the language and you continue, continue and continue. So we don't have it for our language, so you, we can do it. Next one, we're thinking about static analysis of EO code. That's what we work with already. We have this ongoing project, but we, you may help. Another one, we're thinking how to integrate our languages, Java, for example, and C++. So how about we, uh, inside EOLang, we can use Java code, we can use C++, we can connect this one to, uh, to Java code or C++. Then we're also thinking about automated refactoring of EOLang. So if we have uh, code in EOLang, we may think about a project. We, we need some products, some, some software to refactor it. And the final one, a funny one, maybe JetBrains plugin for, for our language. So that's not a really complex task to make a plugin. So you install it into IntelliJ IDEA, and then you can work with the language. You can get the syntax highlight. You can get the automatic uh, debugging, com compiling, and so on and so forth. So the books. I suggest these two books first, Object Thinking, which I mentioned, by David West, and The Main Driven Design by Eric Evans. That's two books. I also recommend my two books. Of course, because we're talking about elegant objects, two volumes, elegant objects, volume one, volume two, there are two different books, which I wrote. Uh, where to publish, if you go into academic way of research, if you want to research, if you want to become researcher, not a programmer, not only a programmer, then three places where I suggest you publish, there are big conferences, Splash, PLDI, and Popul. So all of them are about programming languages, and there you can go and talk about object-oriented programming and explain them that something is wrong or you found a better way, 
and so on and so forth. Uh, call to action. If somebody is interested to play with what I told you, then you can go to this repository on GitHub. It's my repository called Hangman. Hangman is a pretty simple game where you just give a letter. There's a, there's a word being made, then you give a letter, and if, you, if the letter is in the word, then you, you, you open the letter. If not, then we draw a picture of a Hangman. It's a very popular game. So it is written in Java there, in this repository, in a procedural way. So try to rewrite it in an object-oriented way. Try to rewrite it without static methods, like we discussed, without these cross-links between objects, with object encapsulating objects. Try it. There are, I think, about 100 pull requests already submitted by people who tried that. So you can go and see how other students, because I was presenting this to a number, to a few universities in Moscow, uh, giving them this repository as well, asking them to try, and some people try it. So you can also go there and see how people experiment and how they suggest more object-oriented way of writing code. And submit yours, submit your pull request. I will take a look and we see. Okay, my final slide. So what is going on? How I think we can, you can, and we can. What's not solved in the area of object thinking, object-oriented programming? The first question is how can we motivate coders to, for better object-oriented practices? So I'm telling you, static methods are bad. Null, are ba like all null references are bad. Like mutability is bad. And you just listen for it. And you go back and you continue, continue using these techniques in your code because Google says so, for example. So how can we motivate programmers to, to do it better, to code better, code object-oriented in a better way? I don't know. I, probably nobody knows. The second one is how to create better programming languages. Another topic. I mean, we're trying to solve, to, to answer this and this question, but maybe you will, you will in some time. Next one is how to catch bad, bad object-oriented practices automatically. Again, we know how to catch static method. We can say, okay, don't use a static method, but that's quite primitive probably. So how we can catch more complex, uh, you know, violation of, uh, of a good object-oriented uh, way of thinking. And the final one, how to, can we prove? That's very interesting to me. How can we prove instead of just saying intuitively that static is bad or null is bad, but how can we prove it? Looking at the code, maybe empirically, maybe somehow else, how can we prove to the, to the, to the computer society that certain object-oriented uh, approaches and practices are bad and certain are good? That's a very interesting question. Last year, we actually, in, in, in the laboratory where I work now, we published a paper, a scientific research paper, paper, where we demonstrated that the code where null references are being used, in general, demonstrate higher complexity. So we just compared a lot, a lot of code, Java code, and we, show, and we see by the numbers that when null is there, then the complexity is higher, which is a bad thing. So the higher the complexity, the lower the maintainability, the more difficult it is to read the code and understand the code. So we kind of proved. Maybe we can prove something else, like static, uh, this mutability, and, certain, and so on and so forth.